Welcome to today's edition of the Colors of Life show. Challenges are part of life, but every now and then we may ask ourselves, why do bad things happen to good people? In the studio with me to try and answer this question with examples of, from his personal life, do welcome with me Reverend Aike Uta. Thank you. So Reverend Uta, you met Jesus while you were at the university? Just about to go to university. Okay, and that's some 50 years ago. Yeah. And you, you, you were telling me, you know, this morning before we came into the studio, how you'd, you'd worked with God, you graduated, um, was working as a professional, actively involved in your Foursquare Gospel Church and the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship as well. And then you felt the call of God and you responded. And um, what made you respond to that call? Well, I'd been uh, serving God and loved God, and wanted to do my best for God. Um, I was happy with what I was doing. I thought that was the purpose of God for me. I was in a headquarters church, Four Square Gospel Church in Yaba. I was in charge of music and, and the youth. And that was great. Uh, in fact, I've been approached to go past pioneer some churches, but I didn't feel, I didn't get a sense of calling. But at some point, I felt the Lord wanted me to do more. And um, I responded. And I know you were married. You had met your wife while at university. She was a medical doctor. Okay. And you had studied chemistry. So yeah. you both got married and, and um, started pastoring the church. Yeah. But one year into your pastoring job, mm. tragedy struck. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, we were supposed to start a church in October 2001. My son, uh, my first child and only son, was going back to University of Affairs to resume as a third year law student and had an accident on the road and, uh, and had a spinal cord injury and got paralyzed. And um, we nursed him for one year. Uh, and at the end of the year, actually that was the first, first year of pastoring that church, he passed. Okay, and he was a committed Christian himself. Yeah, we had raised him as a child of God, like all our children, yes. So you have, the boy was your first yes, child, and yes. then three daughters. I have three daughters, yes. Three daughters, yes. And you said he asked you a question after the accident when you visited him in the hospital. What did he ask you? I, when I got his bedside, he'd be looking scared, looking lost. So when he saw me, it was like he brightened a little bit. And it was, my daddy's here. Something's going to happen. He said, Daddy, what's God telling you about me? And that nearly broke me. But I, I had to be strong. And I said, well... God is in control, and I began to pray for him. And how was his faith through that experience in that year? And how did your wife and his sisters cope with it? Well, if, as a matter of fact, that was a, a huge challenge. Um, he, we expected God would intervene. God would heal him. We prayed. My friends all over the whole world prayed. My wife, a medical doctor, put his enti her entire life on her, on him, trying to take care of him, um, give him the best care we could afford. Um, we, it got to a point the hospital had done it, all they could do and couldn't do anything more. We had to bring him home and uh, kept nursing him. And uh, of course, this, the, the sisters were shattered. It was a well-built well boy, handsome boy, you know, the pride of everybody's life. And seeing him lying helpless in bed was, was, was tragedy for all of us. But we are brave. We trusted in the grace of God. Okay. And then um, he eventually passed, just like you said. But he, did, he, he passed when your wife was not around. Mm -hmm. She had gone to the U.S. to attend to another challenge the family was going through. Can you yeah. tell us about that? My first daughter had gone to, to the States for studies and... Um, Around about the time this whole issue, this whole tragedy was going on with my son, we got in 
uh, uh, an email from another another of my my second daughter. She said, "Daddy, I don't know how you're going to handle this, but you're my pregnant. That's our, our first daughter, and um, that was that was a huge shock. They said, "Child would raise the way of God," and um, don't know what happened, and this happened. So, so here you are dealing with a child who's had an accident and yes. is paralyzed. Yes. And the, here you're hit again with yes. another news. Yes. So it was, it was beyond words. They say, if, if you, you don't want to say a child is your favorite, but this was like a, a child where raised never gave us any trouble, um, but she ran into this problem. And uh, while your wife was there uh, helping her look after the baby she had had, yes. Your son passed. Yeah, 10 days before my wife was supposed to return, our son passed. And probably the, the hardest day of my life was the day my, she, was, she got back home without knowing that the boy had passed. And uh, she got home and went straight to the room where the boy used to stay, and it was empty. He said, where is Timothy? And everybody looking at her. And I just held her and began to sing for her. And she came home with your grandson. Four year, four year old grandson. Four months four, old. Four months old grandson, grandson yes, in, yes. in her hands. Yes. And I'm sorry we're moving so fast, um, but you're about to round off after pastoring for like 17 years. But yes. the last years of your pastoring were also very difficult because of a health challenge in the family. Tell us about that. My wife of close to 40 years had been struggling with cancer. And... Um, uh, I retired in mandatorily according to our, our regulation of my church at 70 in 2017 and uh, 2018, May, May 5, May 25, 2017, my wife passed. So it must, I can imagine it was devastating, yeah. you know, getting yeah. to know that your wife had cancer. Yes. And I'm sure the church was praying and you were praying, but God never healed her. Yes. So how do we face, how, how do we live with this sort of disappointments when prayer is not answered? Please share with us. Well, when this happened, like I said, I've been pastoring, I've seen miracles, I've seen healing. And then you prayed and um, received words of knowledge that she's going to be healed, gone to healing conferences, had revelations, she's going to be healed. And then this happens. Uh, the first question to ask yourself, can I believe God again? You know, can I believe again? I believed and prayed, and it didn't happen. Can I believe God again? Your faith is shaking. You go to what I call the fight of faith. Um, but if you ask me, why, why do good people experience bad things? Life is not discriminatory. Jesus said to us, in this world, you have tribulation. It be of good courage, I have overcome the world. Uh, life happens to everybody, but what life does to you is determined by what life finds in you. Uh, the same sun that can cake up the clay melts the wax. So how did you personally cope through these major challenges? How were you able to get up every day and still serve God? Well, I... I had, to be honest with you, I had to dialogue with God. I went straight to God and said, Lord, talk to me. Uh, for instance, after my wife's funeral, and I'd gone, gone to rest about three, three months in the U.S. and came back, the first night I lay on the same bed, we'd been together for close to 40 years, and I stretched my hand where she used to be, and it was empty. And I said to myself, so this is it. And the Lord said to me, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So the, the key thing is to be honest with yourself and God and, and talk to God. And, and, and God gave me that word. When my son passed, he asked me, and I was asking the same question, he said to me, as he stopped loving me because I have challenges. Romans 8, 35, you know. Which says what? We said, has God, a New Living Translation, has God stopped loving us because we have challenges? So, and he said, what can separate us from the love of God? Nothing can separate us. I said, of course, I said no. And God said to me, you'll give me sons. Okay. 
Thank you, yeah. Reverend Uta. Yeah. This is so much to take in. Yeah. Um, but indeed, I can see that the love of God yeah. and your trust in the Lord has helped you yeah. thus far. Yes. So we'll take a break now. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we've been in conversation with Reverend I.K. Uta, um, telling us his story of really difficult situations, but how his faith in God has enabled him overcome. Let's take a break. I'm reading from the Colors of Life devotional. The topic is from generation to generation, and the scripture is Joel chapter 1, verse 15. Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. God instructed the Israelites to pass on the memory of their experiences with him onto their children, who would in turn pass it on to their own children, and so on. Now this instruction is also for you and me. But we must not only tell our children of God's goodness, we need to also let them know of his impending judgment on those who insist on going their own way. One of the ways we can deliberately share our knowledge of God with our children is by having a daily prayer as a family. That way we pass on our faith from generation to generation. It's important that we make time out daily to commune with God. From my experience, I would say first thing in the morning is the best time to do so. Now in this time of fellowship, we can praise God, thank Him, pray to Him, and also make time to listen to Him. One of the most common ways God speaks is through His Word, the Scriptures, and that's where the use of a devotional is so important. God has a word just for you. Get your copy of the Colors of Life devotional today. The dream of most young girls is to get an education, get a good job, and find a husband, get married, and start a family, particularly when you are a Christian girl or a Christian woman. But it doesn't always work out that way. Then comes the question again, why do bad things happen to good people? Because that person is probably very committed with God, walking with God, and that desire to get married has not yet materialized. That's the conversation I'll be having with my guest today. So please join me to welcome, I'll call her Sister Bucci. Thank you. <laughs> hmm. Your story is fascinating we'll get into it mm. because you got married at what age 61 61 mm. for the first time yes and you had given your life to christ as a teenager mm. um but maybe not too grounded and eventually rededicated your life just before you got into university mm. you became a committed christian yeah so did you have proposals where any young men interested? How come you didn't get married early? Well, uh, the proposals came, but none of them, you know, um, resulted into marriage, you know, when they came. Um, that's what happened. Were you being too fussy, do you think? I really don't know, but I feel that I have a choice to marry who I love. Because I had some people saying, just marry this person, just marry that person, because you've been staying long. But I felt that I would marry whoever, you know, I love, not just because I was staying long and, you know. And it wasn't coming. No, it wasn't. Yes. Yeah, so you, you graduated a first degree, a master's, went into the civil service and rose through the years. And tell me about your experience in the civil service. I know you kept moving from place to place. And obviously, a beautiful woman, you would have met many people. What are some of the challenges you had in your years as a professional woman and a committed Christian? Um, the truth is that every single person is vulnerable to challenges. Um, it could come from uh, sexual harassment. Um, it could come from, like, you know, I was uh, heading... I headed to offices, state offices. And, in a uh, government parastate? Yes, okay. in a federal government agency. And I, I worked with a lot of men, 
And uh, sometimes, immediately they see you are not married, they just, you know, want to disrespect you, um, talk to you anyhow, you know. But every uh, single person should um, know his or her, Any, every single lady should know her onions. For example, know your job very well, you know. Uh, some of us Christians, we just do our work anyhow. And that also brings negligence. You know, people uh, treat you anyhow, you know. But when you know your work very well, um, it will be very difficult for people to push you aside. Okay, you know? so you, you face sexual harassment. Yeah. So that's from the office. But yeah. I'm sure there were also pressures from the church, from home. Tell us what are the pressures that a single mature woman, Christian, would face? You have pressures, whether in the church or your family, of people asking you, when are you going to get married? And you really don't have anybody to show that. In, I mean, I have somebody, you may not even be in any relationship, and that becomes a problem. Some people may even ask you to um, go sleep with any man and just have a I baby. I was going to ask, were you ever tempted? Because I have a friend who's a mature Christian lady, and she said, I don't even know whether I should just go ahead and have a child. So did you face that, and why did you not go that route? I have a cousin of mine, my first cousin, who said to me once, um, why don't you just sleep with any man and have a baby? I said, I wouldn't do that because I'm a Christian. And she wasn't really happy, you know. She felt we are just trying to help you and you are still holding on to this, your Christian, Christian faith, you know. So I had that experience. I, I had a, an experience in my office when a, somebody told me, one of my bosses said to me, you know you can enjoy this office if you can let down your guard. And by that he meant? Oh, if you can just sleep with anybody, then you'll get whatever you and want. And life will be easier, yeah. seemingly. <laughs> yeah. Won't it? yeah. But I, of course, every child of God, you know you are a child of God. You just have to be committed to your faith. And you were committed to your faith. Tell me about your life. Uh, you know, at church, your, your, your faith life and serving God. Tell me about that, because that rang through when I listened to your story. Yeah, you know, um, I told you about my transfers from the office, from Lagos. We went to Abuja, Abuja, and so many other places. Ibadan. Yes, uh, Umwahia, um, Enugu. Okay. I, I went to all those places. But any place I went to, I found my church and I became active in the church. I became committed. And that really helped me a lot. Which church is this? Four Square Gospel okay, Church. So that, that helped you because Four Square is also everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Although it doesn't mean that if your church is not another. I think the, the, the lesson here is to always be committed in the house of God. Yeah. And that kept you going. Yes. How? Practically, how? Because I'm sure you were praying and trusting God and believing God for. So how, how did you stay committed? Well, I think, let me just say it was God. Okay. God really helped me, you know, because um, everywhere, I, I don't like to go to a church and just sit idle. Okay. I must be doing something for God. Okay. In fact, sometimes I even go beyond the church. Like when I was in Umwahia, I also joined the full gospel, okay. you know, and... Um, you know, doing one thing or the other. So, and I've always been a church person. I've always been in Foursquare. Okay. Um, when I was in Enugu, I wanted to try another church. But it didn't, you know, I've, I'm so used to Foursquare. Okay. Know. So everywhere I went, you went. I identified with Foursquare. I made sure I was working in church. Okay. I made sure I was known. Okay. Because that's one, uh, one avenue through which the devil can have access to you. Okay. You are not known. You just worship and go out, worship and go out. Nobody's, you are not responsible to anybody. Okay. The pastor doesn't even know you. Yeah. In fact, I, I would always call the pastor, okay. say, please, I'm coming from Soso -so -so Church. Mm -hmm. And then I, um, I've been sent on transfer. And okay. I, I move in. Immediately. Okay. So I want to hear about your final posting just before you retired. Mm -hmm. So... Um, someone comes to you, I believe, in Ibadan. You hadn't been long in Ibadan, and they tell you you're being posted to Abia State. Mm. Tell us about that. 
Yes, one of uh, um, the director of uh, Human Resources called me one evening. I was driving home from work uh, because I, I, I grew up in Ibadan, so that was home for me, and I was really enjoying it. And if you live in Ibadan, the cost of living is very low. So I was enjoying Ibadan. My father was still alive, so we could see. But, you know, one evening, um, the director of human resources in our office from Abuja called me and said, oh, Buchi, you are going on transfer to Abia. I said, Abia. I said, I don't want to go to Abia. I don't want, I screamed, I shouted. She said to me, you don't know what God has in store. I said, God doesn't have anything. I bet she pacified me. She counseled me and I calmed down. And she said, all this uh, talk you are talking, you have barely two days to leave. So I left and got to Abia. And when I got to Abia, um, I stayed in the hotel. So the first morning, when we had spent the night, the first morning, uh, and I heard, you know, uh, fellowship in the morning, like devotion in that hotel. And I said, oh, there must be a strong Christian presence in this place. And I later on found out that truly there's a strong Christian presence in Abia. Almost everybody there is born again, you know. Um, but I didn't like the place. Um, I Coming from Lagos, coming from Abuja. Abuja, big city. <laughs> No, that to come there. Oh, my goodness. After one month, I felt like running, running back to say, please, I don't want to stay there, but I stayed, you know. And I you stayed. got involved in the church, no more. Oh, definitely. Well. Definitely. I got in, involved in the church, you know. And funny enough, it's a very small church. Um, as at the time I was there, I'm not even sure we were up to 50. I'm okay. not sure with children, you know, but I got involved and... Uh, they all knew me, and um, I and you eventually began to like. Yes. Umu Ahia. you made friends, connections, yes. relationships. Yes, and then getting to retirement. What was your, you know, state of mind? Were you going to leave Abia or? Well, when I had stayed for some time, um, I started having some friends, you know, and connections that helped my work. Okay. Yeah, you know. Um, uh, and I was quite visible in the States okay. to the glory of God. So I think that calmed me a bit. But I still had this mindset that I will just walk here and go. You know, th this is not my home. But towards the end of my stay, I had become in love with Abia now. Okay. That I said to them at the retirement party that, oh, I don't think I'm living here. I would like to, you know, stay here after retirement. And that was actually my plan. Mm. You know, there's so many questions that I would imagine that single people, men and women, may have on their heart listening in on our conversation. Mm. Um, for instance, you were a career woman, really busy going you know, ahead with your career. And I know you traveled um, a lot. Do you think that as singles, sometimes we may be putting a career before um, marriage, not taking the issue of settling down that that seriously, what, what, what would you say to that? Well, I think um, what actually pushed me into being a career person was the fact that I, being a single person brought loneliness into my life. So I needed to take care of that loneliness by working. So I buried myself in my work. Okay. And first of all, I buried myself in Christ. Okay. You know, because I remember once, so one of my colleagues was asking me, say, do you know so-so-so thing is happening in your department? I said, I don't know. He said, oh, this church has scattered your head. I said, let it even <laughs> scatter the more, you know. Okay. So I knew I had Christ. Okay. And I also knew I had my job. So I buried myself into my job. And um, I was still hopeful because there was a time I was really praying I will do dry fast, I will do wet fast, I will do all kinds of fasting. I was living a fasted life just because of this issue. 
And I'm sure around you, you probably know of people who are not that committed as Christians getting you married. You can say that again. <laughs> All my younger ones got married. And then you said to me, you come from a family of how many children? About 14. Okay, so you have 13 siblings. Yes. Everyone else is married but you. Yes. So that must have been a lot of pressure. Yes. Did people was. try to matchmake you? Oh, a lot. Okay. A lot. Mm -hmm. um, so many people, even when I was in the university... Even in secondary school, they wanted to match make me. I refused. Even when I was now ripe for marriage, I still refused because I felt the, the, the concept I've always had is you, uh, the man goes to pray, receives from God, and comes and talks to the woman, and the woman also prays. That has always been my idea. <laughs> so when you come with matchmaking, I don't even want to hear about it. You okay. Know. Yeah. Now so, let, let's go to after you had retired. Um, at this point, had you given up on marriage? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, I had given up on marriage. Um, first of all, I felt, God, you didn't do this thing all this while. So I'm no more interested. So I have put it behind me. I, I looked at the circumstances around me. I looked at my age. I looked at the people around me, all of them married, and the urge wasn't even there to marry anymore. So I was just moving on with my life. So that is exactly what happened. But was there a point at which um, my, my first guest was talking about what can separate us from the love of God? Mm. Did you get to a point where the fact that you were not married and or God had not given you a husband would have separated you from the love of God? Like I told you, all I had left in this life was God. So if I decide to separate myself from God, what else do I have? I had nothing, you know, except God. So you so, held on? Yes, I held and on. And you were God. ready to just stay that way for the rest of your life? Yes. Okay. I knew that it was only me and God now. Because in some cases, your relatives could fail. In some cases, all the, even your job could fail. So I held on to God, and God proved himself mighty. That, you know, my singlehood was not even, you know, um, it wasn't like, um, um, it wasn't, you know, he didn't stand against me. There was every, in my career, I was heading, you know, some of our state offices, irrespective of being single. In church, too. I had reached the highest position in church in the four square, you know, being in the council, you know, and all this I did as a single person. So, so singlehood is not, um, is, is not uh, a minus. Okay. It's not a minus. But at all. when, you know, we are, we, are, we are natural human beings with natural desires, you know, so when that desire comes to, to be loved by a, a, a man, and to have even a physical relationship with a man, how does a Christian cope with those desires that are left unfulfilled? Because in a sense, if you're waiting on the will of God, you can't just get up and do whatever you want to do. Like as a child of God, you're not expected to have sex outside marriage. So when those natural legitimate desires come up, how do we cope? Well, um, I think if you want to be a Christian, be a Christian. A situation where, for example, our young people, they are one leg in church, and then on the other hand, they say they are dating, with the sense that, you know, um, any man that comes, you want to grab. In fact, a few days ago, somebody came uh, to me and was saying, you know, that she, somebody uh, in, ch in church, I don't know if he's, he's the man that is having an interest in her or she is having. But that the man, seeing that she's desperate, was now asking her for money. So she's the one now giving the man money. And the man talks to her anyhow. I said, you have not even entered. I said, you don't have to be desperate. It's either you are marrying the right person or you are not. Mm, that's so, another. Yeah, so don't be desperate. Point, yes. uh, somebody just says, How are you? You start reeling off your CV <laughs> because you are desperate. Don't be desperate. Mm. Marriage is not the be all and end all in our lives. 
the key thing is for us to have an intimacy with God. And once you have that intimacy, God will cause those natural desires to die. I'm mm. telling you. Mm. But if you now uh, start tempting yourself, somebody sends you a text, how are you doing? Ah, you jump at it, you're excited. This, those desires will come. So you have to flee every appearance of evil. evil. I like that, the issue of desperation, because I have friends, you know, who, um, because they were growing older and they were not married, just went into marriage for, for marriage sake, and most of them are divorced now, you know, and um, also the, the fact that God can actually suppress those natural desires for mm -hmm. a physical relationship is a reality, mm -hmm. as we can see from your life. Thank you very much for this session. Thank We're you. going to take a break and still come back and conclude our conversation. Okay. Ah, so we're talking about coping with the challenges of life while we're tr still trying to hold on to God. We'll take a break and when we come back, we'll conclude this conversation and I'll bring back my first guest, Reverend Uta. So please stay with us. Welcome back to Colors of Life. We began with asking the question, why do bad things happen to good people? My first guest was a gentleman who'd served God for decades, even as a pastor, and yet he lost his only son and his wife. Then in the second session, I spoke to a lady who'd been serving God faithfully for decades and marriage was not coming. So now I've brought both of them together for the concluding conversation and we see the manifestation of Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to their purpose, to his purpose. <laughs> so Reverend Uta, welcome back. Thank you. And Sister Bucci, welcome back. Thank you. Now, the great revelation is that you're married. <laughs> so God's faithfulness came through yeah. in the end. Yeah. He gave you a second chance at marriage. Yeah. And then you actually did get married when you had given up. Yes. So I'm sure my audience would be itching to hear how did it happen? How did you meet? Who do I speak to first? <laughs> Well, um, since, since I'm the one who started the journey, okay. we have to speak first. Deciding to remarry wasn't an easy thing you know, because I had to juggle so many facts in my mind. I'd had a wonderful marriage, the best any man could think about for, about for close to 40 years. And um, deciding to marry, I had the question, will I be able to love another woman again? Will it be fair? And, uh, but... On the other hand, I realized I couldn't be alone. It would be difficult to live alone the rest of my life. So I was kind of conflicted. Uh, but I think the, the desire to, for companionship overruled. Okay. And uh, I decided to get married again. Okay. And the question beca beca became, how do I locate the person? You know, I lost the art of uh, toasting women, <laughs> like they're using in modern parlance. Um, so I told a few of my friends to recommend if they knew somebody they thought I could like, I would like. Um, they introduced me to a, a number of ladies, some of them I didn't like at all. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So it's important we like the person we're going to get married to. I, I, as a pastor and a counselor, I knew that you don't just, uh, they don't get into marriage unadvisedly. Okay. Uh, first of all, you need to be assured of the God's will. Yeah. And it got to be somebody you, you appreciate, you okay. love. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those two items, those issues are very important. Okay, so, so how did you then get it? Did you get introduced to her? Well, one of my friends uh, mentioned her. Okay. And uh, we connected uh, uh, in a very interesting way. She happened to be working in my hometown, Umuahia. And that was the Umuahia. You did not want to, to be grow. transferred to from yeah, Ibadan, yeah. your yeah. beloved Ibadan. Yes. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I had planned to go home for an event, for a funeral. Okay. Uh, just about the time the connection was made. So I didn't have to travel anywhere to go look for her. She was already in my hometown. Wow. So, uh, so I talked with her. 
and uh, and uh, I had peace when I saw her. I had okay. peace about it, okay. and um, the usual initial uh, reluctance. But uh, you I did guess, say well, to me that she was playing hard to get. Yeah, well, don't wear just kind of usual female female <laughs> tricks. Even though she already uh, <laughs> won't look at me, it was love at first sight. <laughs> I like that. Was it? You t t tell me, Sister Bucci. Was it really love at first sight, or was it a journey for you? Tell me. Um, what I would say is that uh, you know we, we didn't meet physically at first. We we're talking on phone, and uh, I found out that I could relax with him. Okay. I found out that I couldn't even play hard to get. Mm. I found out that all my usual uh, walls were broken down, you know. Wow. Uh, so um, I, I really didn't see any need okay. to play hard to get or whatever. So, um, and how long had, he, had you been talking before he proposed? Uh, within three weeks wow. on, on that particular trip. I had a short time to stay at home, and I wanted to make up my mind, you know, whether this was it or not. You're a decisive man. Mm -hmm. So for my husband, it was four weeks, and I thought, who does that? But now I'm here in three weeks. Yeah, you know, if, um, we're, not, we're not kids. Yeah. If yeah. you knew what we wanted, why play around? Okay. You know, so, okay. yeah. Fantastic. But you said that God spoke to you after you had said yes, and what did God say to you? Well, God told me that, you know, um, looking at um, Hebrews chapter 11, okay. that's a hall of fame okay. for people who had worked for God and uh, they succeeded. <clears throat> you, you know, their stories were told in that chapter. And that God said to me that marrying him was an assignment from him and that he was going to also uh, check you know, whether I would do it well or not. Hmm. So, I, you know, as God said me that, said that to me, sorry, I, I knew it was a confirmation that, you know, this is from God. Okay, and Reverend Tai, remember you said something about, you asked different people about, about her. What was their response? Well, around that time, I was trying to check her out. <laughs> uh, first of all, we had, we, we had connected without knowing. Okay. Both on a church level, okay. uh, and then she went to Unilag, and I went to Ife. But okay. a lot of our mutual friends uh, knew her very That's well. That's an important thing, that yeah. both of you belong to the first square church. Yeah, yes. Okay. And anybody I asked, I asked from about her gave glowing report. Oh, it's a nice girl. And I give she agrees, it's a nice girl, a nice girl. Everyone said so, the so same the, thing. So the... The due diligence wasn't a problem, you know. <laughs> I didn't have to go too far. Yeah. And uh, and uh, that was it. Was easy. Yeah, but but I know you have children. You have three daughters. Yes. And I'm sure it was important what they thought. Yeah. So what? How did you over? You know, how did you deal with that? Shortly after the demise of my late wife, and I spent time to recover, recuperate with the kids in the US. Before leaving, we had discussed the future. Okay. And. Um, we, it was clear to us that daddy wouldn't remain single the rest of his life. Okay. So the possibility, the possibility of remarrying was there. Okay. Uh, it was like a, a tacit agreement that okay. this would happen. Okay. But when eventually I told them that I've seen the person I wanted to marry and that we're going to get married in April. <laughs> that was how many months after? About, about four months. Okay. Uh, about four months. Okay. Uh, from, from contact to time we wanted to get married, their faces dropped. He said, Daddy, we don't even know her. <laughs> you know, and for that night, uh, I was disturbed because if they opposed, okay. it, would, it, would, it would affect my decision. I can imagine. Uh, it, yeah. would, it would affect my decision. So we said, okay, well, since we couldn't travel because COVID already set in, okay. um, we said we're going to have some conferencing, video conferencing. Somewhere to before, before the end of the year, we had a conferencing. And... Uh, and I let them talk, let them converse. And at the end of the day, the next day I asked them, what, what, do, what do you think? Well, I said, I kind of like her. <laughs> so, so the same reports yes. from outside. So it's so important. Yeah. What I'm hearing for single women, for anyone really as a Christian, Christian character, mm. you know, the way we relate to people is so important because we don't know where it, it, would, it would work in our favor. Mm. Now, it, it cannot be very easy. Having mm. had a good marriage for like 40 years and then it ended and having never been married. So what's the major challenge, would you say? 
<laughs> well, the major adjusting Adjust. issue yes. yeah. is, you see, having had a very good marriage, it's been, it can be difficult not to have flips or bad or past, past memory. Okay. So, okay, from time to time, things remind you and you, you, you begin to remin reminisce over the past. And as you reminisce, somehow it affects your, your mood. Okay. And of course, she notices. Okay. And, and I, like I said to you, I've been eternally grateful to her that she, she, she was able to bear with my, my flips of moods. You know, I know some ladies would feel very bad about that. Yeah. Uh, so that's been the major challenge. Okay. But we, we, we've gone on, because of her ability to I, 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 bear with me, yeah. been able to deal with that. Yeah. Yes. And, and you've said the Lord told you it's an assignment. So mm. apart from his own um, personal conflicts, you know, from time to time, but he was a pastor of a church. It can't be easy. The church has been used to their pastor's wife. Then they have to now grow to love another. So, uh, you know, their pastor has now brought another woman into their lives as it were, and that can be very easy. So how has that word of God helped you relate to the church uh, members and even to your husband? Well, in fairness to the church, I remember the first day I came to church, um, you needed to see the warm reception I got. I oh, was so really? surprised. Okay. I was really, really <laughs> surprised. I was also apprehensive, you know, um, when he was, uh, uh, when we were courting, he didn't really give me a total picture of, you know, his pedigree. Okay. Uh, hey, he just said, oh, I pastored this church. I didn't know how big the church was. I didn't know anything. I, I didn't even know there was a Foursquare church in VGC. Okay. So it was through him I knew. So coming into the church, seeing such a big church, seeing a, a church that is uh, made of who who is who yes, you know yes uh, but which well which is not too uh, far from what i had when i was in asokoro okay. we had that type of uh, a model of a church but i i must assure you that i received a lot of warm welcome okay. that first day you needed to see people lining up i met one of my friends we had been in the university together and she kept on talking. They had to warn her that, look at us. We are many waiting to greet her. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you talked about your life of prayer together and how important that is. Tell us about it. Yes, that. We, we, we want to thank God um, uh, and thank him too because he believes every morning we must have a devotion. And uh, devotion can be two hours, one hour, you know, and it has really helped us, you know. And at night too, we also have another time of prayer. So that has helped us helped a lot. You. Okay. A lot. This, your, your story is such a blessing. It has certainly blessed me. I mean, when my husband proposed, we got married in like three months and everyone's like, who does that? But I've heard now what that <laughs> <laughs> another person has done it. So thank you very much for sharing this beautiful story of redemption, God's grace and God's faithfulness. I'm sure it will encourage the viewers as much as it has encouraged me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. This is where we draw the curtain on today's edition of Colors of Life. Thank you for staying with us. Do share this video, like us, leave a comment, tell your friends about the show. This is the Colors of Life show where we seek to know Christ and to make him known.